Prior to approval of the consent agenda, any member of council may have an item from the consent agenda removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Consent agenda items include approval of minutes, cash balances, revenue and expenses, notifications regarding the next work session. At this time, council could take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second that. I have a motion by council member Deaton, second by council member Cooper. Is there any discussion? Take a roll, please. Council member Cooper? Yes. Council member Deaton? Yes. Mayor Bertan Zielinski? Yes. Council member Ginsky? Yes. Council member Woodluck? Yes. Council member Pontiac? Yes. And Mayor Smith? Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Unfinished business, we have none. New business. Uh, notices, communications, and announcements, we have none. Uh, we have a report from the city clerk and the Alliance for Economic Success. The regular part of each council meeting is a report <coughs> from the operating agency, organization, or department. At this time, Ms. Michelle Wright will report on the activities of the city clerk's office and respond to any questions the council may have regarding their activities. My report's mainly on the uh, update on what happened with the elections last year. Um, first of all, the, uh, for the clerk's department, in our budget, there's uh, just two full-time employees and, um, and then our part-time election workers. For full-time, we have Mary Bachman, who's the deputy clerk and is in charge of accounts payable. And myself, I'm the city clerk and the chief deputy treasurer. And this year we used about 30 part-time um, election workers, which is down 50%. Mary has uh, certifications of a master municipal clerk, which she earned through the International Institute of Clerks. She's a certified Michigan municipal clerk. We earned that by going to a three-year um, institute. She's a licensed insurance agent, and she took over accounts payable this year. Um, formerly, she did the uh, payroll and the benefits. She's been with the city for 17 years. And myself, I'm also a master municipal clerk, uh, the certified Michigan municipal clerk. Um, I've also am a certified public finance administrator and a certified professional treasurer, which those are earned through the Treasure, Treasures Association, and I've been with the city for 27 years. We also look, work closely with the Finance and Treasury Department. We're all pretty much one big department. Um, Heather Copley is the Deputy Treasurer, and she took over the payroll and benefits. She's been here for 16 years. Ed Bradford is the Chief Financial Officer and the City Treasurer and has been here 14 years. And Kelly McCall is in charge of the accounts receivable and the water billing, and she's been here for one year now. Some changes, um, Mary will be retiring in the March of this year, and we've named Heather as she'll be taking over as the Deputy Clerk. She's also attended the three-year institute for the, uh, the Clerks Institute, and she's attended the three-year Treasurer's Institute, so she's certified by the state with both of those organizations. Some of our other uh, responsibilities besides elections, we do payroll, um, take care of insurance, accounts payable, um, do the IRS reporting, the uh, general ledger in the county, uh, take care of the city council meetings and minutes, business registrations, <coughs> bid openings, um, records retention and archival. There's um, a lot of public interaction that we do. Um, we do a lot of research 
even the museum calls us for research for <coughs> his articles. I'm not sure what he does with all of it, but so that's just the name of a few of the daily activities. So in 2016, we had uh, three elections, the presidential primary, the state primary, and the general election. And for the average voter turnout, I used an average for those three different elections. Um, our registered voters average is 4,823. We actually have more than that right now. We're at 4,863. It tends to go up and down. Um, people will then move out all the time. But, um, so anyway, in March, we had about 32% turnout. <coughs> August, 29% turnout. Which August is just the state primary. March was the presidential primary. And then for the general election in November, we had about 61.5% turnout. And this year we had permanently consolidated our election precincts. We used to have seven precincts. Uh, they're down to two now. And that became effective of November 2015. So this is our first full year with consolidation. Previously we've done some smaller consolidations if it was just like the city council election. Um, or maybe just a school election, we used to consolidate those to help save money. But um, any large elections, we weren't able to do that uh, without the state commission and election commission had to approve it. So we had to jump through a lot of hoops to get that consolidated. Um, so our precinct one is at the Manston Marina building, which is our city council districts one, two, and three. Precinct two is at St. Joe's, which is the council districts four through seven. And no changes were made in the um, council districts at all. So I thought I'd show you some of the historical costs. Um, you start at the bottom, the November 2012 was the last presidential election. That cost us about $9,000. Um, in 2014, those were the state elections. They're a little bit cheaper, but they're still $7,000, $8,000. That's with using all seven precincts. You have to hire, um, you have to have at least four people. State regulations, you have to have three people at each precinct working. And we would try to do four to six. You know. um, some people can only work park days and so anyway we were able to cut down the number of workers, um, the number of uh, supplies we needed, the, the amount of program we needed is all been reduced. So this year our cost for March was $2,200. Um, August and November, about $4,800. Uh, November, I'm not, I don't have the final total, but I rounded it up. I, I figured it's going to be close to the $4,800. So if you look at the screen before, in November 2012 for the uh, presidential election was $9,000. We're at $4,800, so we cut it down significantly. Just for the wages for the election, this does not include my <clears throat> wages or the deputy clerk's wages. Um, we budgeted, trying to estimate it, we budgeted at three thousand for each election. Uh, the actual cost was uh, six thousand one hundred seventy-four, so I was over one hundred seventy-four dollars. But for the first time doing this, I was pretty pleased with the the number it came out at. Previously it was $6,500 each election, <coughs> just for wages. So we um, saved about 52.5% on that line item. And <coughs> I 
next year is a small, or this year now, is a small year for elections. Uh, possibly a school election in May, and then our city general election in November. Uh, I haven't heard of anything else throughout the county being, being talked about yet. Do you have any questions? There were a lot of issues um, this year with the potential for a recount where uh, precincts couldn't be recounted because things didn't match up. Did we have any issues here? I don't believe so. Once we started using receiving boards, which the precincts, they bring um, two members of each um, election board, they bring theirs the bags, the, the equipment, and all the uh, um, results at the end of the night, they bring it here to City Hall. We have a receiving board, so it's another fresh set of eyes to make sure that, you know, went through all the, filled in all the blanks that they need to for the end of the night, and make sure everything's sealed up properly. Um, we don't know that, you know, nobody checked it other than us, you know, we felt confident that they were would be recountable if it need be, but the final say would be if the county and the state had to come do that recount. And um, I don't see any reason why there would not there should have not been any reason not to be counted. Okay. Is there any backlog or or, or delays for people voting with the consolidation to two uh, percent? From what I've seen, when I checked the precincts, they moved along quite well. We um, we did a lot more absentee ballots this year. Um, we actually sent cards out, postcards, offering people the option. You know, if they're 60 years old or more, <coughs> giving them the option to uh, sign up for absentee ballots. Um, that saved a lot of time at the precincts because. This, that many less people going there to vote. You know, we had to use absentee counting boards um, to count those ballots, which we had two of those boards. And um, I thought it all went pretty smoothly for a large election. Okay. Any, any questions? Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Okay. Thanks. At this time, <coughs> Uh, Ms. Tamara Boswinkler will report on the activities of the Alliance for Economic Success and respond to any questions the council may have regarding their activities. Good evening. Um, I'm actually not here alone. I've got Betsy Evans, our business development uh, director, and Eric, who's on our board. So we've got an AES, AES team here tonight to, to talk to you and to give you um, an update on all the wonderful things that happened in the year 2016 at AES and talk about what's going to happen in 2017. So um, Betsy just uh, gave you some paper because I know sometimes it's nice to have it in front of you and you can take it home and look at it. But the one thing I want you to look at right now is the 2016 work plan. Um, the, uh, so this time last year we got direction from uh, administration on what to focus on in the year 2016 and that's what you have on that paper but it's also on this slide. Um, those things correspond with the strategies and goals found in your strategic plan that you look at every year and update and that we're almost done updating for, for 2017. So you know the cycle will happen again, we'll get the list on what you want us to work on for 2017 and we'll be off and running. But last year, what you asked us to look at had to do with um, uh, looking at Manistee County Economic Development Strategy, um, the industrial park, infrastructure development, rail relocation, continued community-wide discussions for uh, collaborative opportunities, housing, vacant properties, and other opportunities for economic development, linking training and jobs, workforce development, and city recreation plan. So those are, those are right from your strategic plan, so you, you should be pretty familiar with those. And so what we're gonna talk about is how we met those uh, priorities that you set for us, um, you know, doing what we said we were gonna do. So um, 
All of you might have heard the, the wonderful work that's been going on in the former Olson building, looking at what we've been working with a uh, multi-party development uh, group, uh, which includes the uh, Council on Aging, uh, retail su uh, supermarket chain, Third Coast Development, and Integrated <coughs> Architecture, and other suppliers to take that entire site and redevelop it. Redevelop it. Uh, so working on this and coordinating this project takes a lot of effort and a lot of time, a lot of different tasks. So we had to coordinate with Olson Food Stores, we had to coordinate with potential uh, financing and funding uh, requirements and opportunities, including the United States Department of Ag, Rural Development, sorry, um, develop financing options and to look at different organizations that we could partner or they could partner with, such as Venture North, MEDC, and other institutions that are developing new market tax credits. Uh, and doing some work on um, assessment of the existing building. Um, and then the really fun part is listening to the reaction from the community. And we've heard that there's already a waiting list for some of these units. Um, so it just shows the incredible need by our seniors in the city and in the county for a project just like this. So the, the retail portion, it's been estimated, will support about 12 to 14 full-time equivalent positions and house quite a few people. Um, so the business attraction, retention, and expansion, uh, some of it's confidential, some of it not so confidential. So um, if I'm vague, it's, it, it's intentional. Um, so in the early stages of two projects uh, with national and regional in, uh, interests um, that would employ 25 to 30 full-time equivalent positions. So we can't speak about the development at this time, but we're looking at two uh, separate projects that we hope will, will employ up to 30 people. Um, we have uh, some folks that are interested in opening a, potentially an Italian restaurant in the downtown. Um, we've been working with a few different restaurateurs about the Boathouse restaurant and trying to fill that space um, with a, a, a new restaurant. Um, working with an entrepreneur about a household uh, furnishing store in the downtown. Also a uh, distillery. We have a building owner that's interested in opening a potential distillery. Um, a resale store, which is in the city right now, but is looking to relocate downtown. Um, and also um, a jewelry and wearables retail, opening a new spot in the downtown. And then we've been working with the Happy Owl Bookshop and um, Kit and Cynthia from the Music Vault. So really a lot of, a lot of interest and a lot of things happening for the, the vacancies in the downtown. We've been also uh, working on uh, the regulatory streamlining. We've had a few uh, municipal units that are interested in coordinating uh, and finding a private um, state inspection company. So rather than utilize the state building inspectors or electrical inspectors and, and having to have that wait time for the developers, uh, we've had a few municipalities that are interested in um, hiring a private company. Um, and, and so we've we have an RFP that is out right now, um, and we have different companies that are interested in su um, submitting a proposal for that. Right now it looks as if the, um, the cost of that would be incurred by the developer or whoever is pulling the permit would essentially cover the cost for those municipalities. But we still have yet to, to go through all that. So this is really a, a deliberate effort to really streamline the program make it a more uh, dependable and a quicker turnaround for the developers um, and just a, and to provide that consistency. So, in the works. So I'm really sorry, I missed one really wonderful project. I don't know how I passed it up, but it's the, um, it's the uh, former Glicks and Milliken building. And uh, so I'll just tell you, you know, we're continuing to work with Hollander Development Corporation to support that adaptive reuse of that building, um, looking at 
you know, creating one to two unit dwellings, uh, which is very much needed and very much documented in the, the regional networks northwest. Um, our regional planning agency who did the target market analysis says we're severely lacking in that market. Um, and so, you know, we're working with him to help him find multiple um, funding sources. Um, you know, this is, uh, in some cases, it's, it really is an affordable housing, a workforce housing uh, development that, that will really um, address some of our housing needs and housing deficiencies. Um, and it's, that need is very much reflected in the city strategic plan, the city redevelopment ready strategy, the county board of commissioners strategic plan, and of course I already mentioned the housing target analysis by Networks Northwest. So that was a mistake. I'm sorry I missed that slide, but uh, housing, this is probably the year for housing, and I think that's a good and exciting thing. So of course my love is planning, and we've done a ton of strategic planning. Which, you know, uh, sometimes I hear groans about planning, so I, I never take it offense, but the more we can get groups to align and understand their mission, um, and the more they understand other organizations, other um, bodies, uh, desires and needs and direction, the more that we're all working on the same team. So, uh, so you know, we're working on the City of Manistee strategic plan update, Blacker Airport strategic plan update. I, I, I encourage you to look at that because that really is an economic development tool. It's, uh, it's really an interesting document. Um, the library strategic plan, that document is going to be instrumental when our director leaves and it transitions into a new director. And um, that plan takes them into the future in a very different direction, so I think you should look at that too. Uh, the city, city marina strategic plan, we did that in 2016. Uh, the city Manistee recreation plan. And then the US 31 quarter plan we're working on. So these are all plans that we actually wrote in house. We didn't uh, uh, seek additional funding from anyone else. We just did it. Um, so, you know, there's other regional planning uh, efforts underway that uh, you, know, you can't have a strong region without a strong city, you can't have a strong city without a strong region, so all of the, this work that's done in and around uh, Manistee feeds off each other and supports each other, and so the manufacturing strategy, which Betsy has been working on and ushering through, is, takes a really hard look at our manufacturing base and, and where that is and where it needs to go and how we can help it. Um, same can be said for the Stronger Economies Together uh, planning effort that, that is also done, and these two documents work together to really look at our industries and help guide us into the future. The Broadband Initiative, um, that, you know, you've heard me talk about that before, we're still working on that. The, the survey is closed, now the next step is to, address, or to attract uh, providers and then get those providers to put in the infrastructure. The US 31 corridor plan, uh, that is really going to help position our uh, commercial property and residential property along the corridor in a way that that uh, is far more productive maybe than what it is right now. And then um, the M22 Pure Michigan Byway designation, it seems like M22 is kind of far away, but it's not, and it attracts a lot of attention and a lot of folks to the region. But our Visitors Bureau was already able to use that designation to get access to other programs that, that they were not able to get to before this designation. So that's only good for uh, the city. And then the Regional Resource Recovery Project, that's the recycling project, that's a regional one. Um, obviously very, very important for uh, our sustainability and stewardship. And then, you know, the, out of the city and the county recreation plan, trails, no matter what master plan, strategic plan, whenever you talk to residents, trail, 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 they want trails. So that committee work, uh, meets once a month and they are looking to connect the city of Manistee through trail system to the rest of the county and, uh, and they are working very hard on that and fast and furious. So we also thought we would take a moment to talk about the AES strategic plan. So we do it too, and we follow it. Um, this year we did an update. And, but we did something different, and, and it's kind of interesting because we may start using the same kind of ideas in other strategic plans. Um, basically, you know, strategic, you guys know what strategic planning is all about. You're looking for issues and opportunities, you're looking at priorities, and you're trying to figure out a course of action to implement it. 
Um, of course, at AES, we have three pillars, business and job development, community development, resource development. Everything we do falls within those three categories. But what we did this year, which is a little different, is we're looking at the, the seven sources of uh, community capital, and we're going to talk about that a little bit as we move through the presentation. So we looked at our vision, or our mission, and revised it slightly this year to just simplify. It's really to just provide business, community, and resource development services to yield economic and community development results. But what's really is key is that it's driven by the local priorities. They are not our priorities. That is, it is by the local municipalities and the communities that we serve. And then our vision is for a sustainable, prosperous communities that are supported by forward-looking strategies that unify the communities, resources to achieve the community goals, and also employers, employees, and a skilled workforce that are diverse, dynamic, and evolving to respond to market conditions. Uh, so real quick, just, you know, we've got goals, community development, they're centered around community and organizational readiness and facilitates so solutions. <coughs> resource development, it's all about financial resources, local priorities, and, uh, you know, responding to local re uh, priorities and removing any barriers, uh, and workforce development. And business development, really one-stop service, so developers have that predictable, reliable um, environment for them to do business in and business expansion and attraction based on data which is really important because we could all want something different but uh, if it's not meant to be it's not meant to be but you look at data and that's that helps guide you guide you so um, you know we've got to have partners uh, to help us do the work that we do and uh, so you know we work businesses local units of governments state and federal agencies tribe uh, regional organizations, nonprofits, foundations, education, everybody and anyone will work with us to help forward the priorities of the communities um, that come to us for, for assistance. So when I talk about that seven uh, sources of capital, they're financial, built, natural, human, social, cultural, and political. This is where it's a little different. This is where we're going to start going to. Financial is about investment capital. Built is about infrastructure. Natural is about our natural environment and, and access to that. Human is about capacities of people. Social is connections, networks among people. Cultural, about values, beliefs, traditions. And political is about regulations, standards, and incentives. Uh, and here's a nice little uh, graphic. And I actually took this from the SEP program, the Stronger Economies Together. This is kind of where strategic planning is moving towards and making impact and then measuring that impact. And so what we're looking to do is measure what we do so that we know that we're making an impact. And so what we're going to do in the next year or so, it's probably going to take a while, is figure out those performance measures that align with each one of those um, capital. So, you know, if we're talking about uh, the built environment, what kind of infrastructure have we put in? If we're looking at human, uh, you know, have we met a educated, do we have an educated skill workforce? And really, what does that, that mean? And so those are the kind of discussions we're going to have. Um, commute for political, are communities development ready? That's something that we've been talking about for quite a while. What does that mean and how do you measure that? So AES within our own organization is going to start developing these performance measures. And then once we work out those bugs, um, I anticipate we're going to move that into other strategic plans that we um, we work on. So our community development goal to support community and organizational readiness for economic development by facilitating the, facilitating the completion and update of plans and strategies, including master plans, recreation plans, corridor plans, and organizational strategies. Through the use of net, and then another goal, through the use of natural facilitation, assist residents, organizations, and units of government to work through difficult issues in order to help them identify issues and opportunities and make high quality decisions that leave lasting positive results. Those are mouthfuls, but uh, that, that's kind of my, those are community development, kind of what directs me and the organization uh, for resource development. Yeah. Which is, you know, primarily Tim Urban's uh, leg of the stool, but to identify, seek, and secure uh, financial resources for the community plans, for their priorities, and the needs of businesses. 
and also working to support workforce development, um, developing the financial resources uh, to train our workers and facilitate the development of, of collaboratives for strengthening skilled-based programming. The business and job development, um, again, to provide that one-stop service to all businesses to help them attain their operational and their financial objectives. And the other goal is to support business attraction and <laughs> expansion. I'm not sure about extraction. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we don't need any extractive businesses, right? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> expansion. So our next steps, um, again, as Tamara said, we're completing the strategic plan for the city. And then it was very helpful in our conversation with that in 2016 to review the top priorities, uh, a list of what are, what are really the true top priorities for the city of Manistee. And then our quarterly reports to you uh, based on those priorities that have been identified and, and given to us as, as our top goals to work on for 2017. So that's it, folks. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer. Uh, it's been always a lot of fun to work for the city, to work with you, to work with the businesses, and then to hear from residents what they'd like to see happen within the city. Uh, that's actually the best part of the job, I think, is talking to people. So. I'd like to talk about 31 Corridor for a minute. OK. I watched 9 and 10 News, saw a, an infomercial. If you will, um, put on by you. You showcased yourself really well. Um, Bear Lake was really promoted. Um, I thought I was watching an infomercial for Bear Lake. Um, I mean, it really, it really was well done. You know, I think that I, uh, that in, that uh, reporter should probably get that compliment. He did a he did a good job. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm hoping to see some of that for here. I would like to see us get some of that uh, publicity. That was really, really well done. Um, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll pass that on to him. But I think what your message is, is getting out the positive message about all the good things that are going on within the, the city. And I can tell you that it's a project like the Lassoons project, when that thing gets approved and starts to head towards completion, or even just a shovel on the ground, I know that that's going to be like, uh, you know, I don't want to say info commercial, but it's going to be a great spotlight for the, the city. You know, all those things are based around projects and things that are happening. So if you ever hear of anything that's happening, you would like us to write a press release. Sounds good. We'll do it. Well, that went way beyond the press release. Though. Did it? I, I, I haven't seen it myself. I can't go on to, yeah. I, I, I was impressed. I and mean, I would like to see Manistee, the city of Manistee, get some of that publicity. That was, uh, that was well, well done. Hmm. If you haven't seen it, uh, I haven't seen it. You need to go, you need to I was on vacation. My head was in the sand. <laughs> no, I mean, um, it, was, it was just well done. You have to see it. For okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, let's do that for the city then, for sure. Any other any other thoughts? I know it's not city related, but have you heard anything that's going on with the old Kmart building? No, I wish I wish I could tell you something, but. Um, that's on lockdown and it has been for, for a while. Did you hear anything new? Uh, no, I have not heard anything and it's, it's very difficult to get a lot of information from that corporation. They are pretty, are pretty tight-lipped. So I have not heard of any new uh, development or any, any potential development out there as of yet. Hmm. I know that Sears went into Fake USA. But, uh, um, could, could you elaborate a little bit on the broadband initiative, please? So, um, so that's something that Betsy and I were actually working on together and um, working with Michigan Connect, an organization who has done broadband development throughout the state of Michigan. And it starts off with a community survey. Um, what they want to, what we're trying to find out is what is the need. So you're quantifying the need so that once you know the need, you can present it to providers and uh, hopefully those providers will then want to come into business here um, in the areas that have the greatest need. Um, yes, it's, it's really creating the case uh, for the provider. So we, in that survey, it was, is internet available to you? If it is available, do you adopt it? And if not, why not? What are the barriers? So is it the cost? Is it it's not fast enough? Or it, does, it doesn't fit my needs anyway? So then going back to those providers and say, okay, Charter and AT&T or 
you know, a lot of the, the independent Wi-Fi um, providers and saying, we have this many people in this area that either say, A, it's not fast enough, can you improve the service, or there's just nothing available, are you willing to expand the infrastructure out into this region so that people can adopt it? So there, there is some money from the state, the Michigan Connect works with the, it's a Department of the Public Service Commission, and so they do have some funds to, to, to give to some of these providers to say, if you're willing to expand that infrastructure, we'll, we'll supplement some of that. So now, with the end of the survey, now it's really putting that together, the maps, and, and going to the providers to see what they can do to expand, to get to that last mile broadband so that everybody has access, and that it's at a usable speed. I guess two stories. I uh, One young woman told me that she lives in the city and she has internet, right? So she's like, do I really need to fill out the survey? And I said, yeah, could you please? She goes, well, you know, now that I think about it, I'm always getting kicked off. Um, because it's not it's not fast enough. It's not the broadband isn't wide enough. It's not it's not meeting my needs. And then just this morning, I had a gentleman who works uh, who's trying to work while live in the Arcadia area, and uh, and he said, "Where are you with broadband? Because I just want to move here and do my job here, but I can't until you have broadband." And I had to tell him, "We're still in work. Sorry." Um, so that's not an unusual story, actually. Somebody wanting to work from home, but can't because we don't have the broadband. So hopefully it will make changes. When you talk Arcadia and, and we look at other communities around here, just, just how big of a footprint are you, are you trying to encompass with this initiative? Well, it's all of Manistee County. The initiative, uh, so through Michigan Connect, all of Manistee was surveyed, Benzie County was surveyed, Leelong County. Who else? Those were from our region. Those from our are region. the three that were taking place right now. So, Benzie County finished up their survey a little, uh, a little before Manistee. So now um, they've kind of put together the report for Benzie. Now they're putting together the Michigan Connect is putting the report together for Manistee County. Uh, because I know our DDA has that as, as one of their initiatives and goals also for the downtown district. Oh, for a public Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? I have a couple. <clears throat> Tamara, I want to thank you for for telling us about jobs. <laughs> I'd like to hear that in your report, so I'm very pleased to cool. hear that we're going to get 12 to 14 jobs uh, in one area, another 25 to 30. Um, and maybe you can't talk about this, but there is supposed to be some retail space on the first floor of um, 400 River Street, which is we call it the Old Lakes Building. Okay. Um, yeah. Have you heard anything about that and what kind of jobs might be? Well, we have heard that uh, specifically on the corner of, of Maple and, and River, there'll be the commercial, the retail component. Right. And uh, I think it's probably too early to find out who, but um, uh, but I bet it will be gobbled up really quick. So don't you think that's just like a high viewing area? Well, I hope um, so. For yeah. sure. Yeah, you know, the, the retail on the first floor and residential on the top floors is the winning combination mix that is successful. Yeah. Any other so, questions or comments? Cool. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, I have one more. Is there any way you can email this presentation that you have up there? Sure, us, no problem. Because we don't have any copies of it unless you email it to us. Sure, but just so absolutely, I, I definitely will. But what I gave you, one of those papers, it's it's the same stuff. It's just easier to read because it's on two pages. But I'd be happy to give you the PowerPoint. That would be great. Okay. We go on to concerns and comments. Citizen comment. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on municipal services, activities, or areas of city involvement. Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comment, limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. Are there any citizen comments? If not, we move on to officials and staff. City clerk? Nothing, Your Honor. City manager? Nothing, Your Honor. City Attorney? Nothing, Your Honor. <coughs> City Finance Director? Nothing, Your Honor. 
public service, no, the safety, yeah. Yeah. Um, public works. I do have one item. Um, Thad wanted me to update the council on our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, our NPDES permit. Uh, we've been working on this with the state of Michigan for at least a year and a half now to get our per permit renewed. And as of January 1st of this year, the permit is now in effect. So it runs through October 1st of 2020. Um, <clears throat> there are three areas where we have some changes in the permit from the previous permit. And I uh, just thought I would highlight those to you. Under the final effluent limitations, and we've got a whole list, pages of things that we have to test for, the frequency, and then the parameters that we have to obtain in our uh, discharge limitations. This year there are, or in this permit, there are two changes to that. Um, one is the requirement to test mercury. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate that our uh, levels of mercury fall well below what the criteria is in our previous permits. So the state has reduced our, our monitoring and testing of that from a monthly basis to a quarterly basis. Doesn't sound like a huge uh, reduction, but it's a very expensive test. So it'll save us uh, quite, a, quite a bit on the uh, operation side. The other thing that the state has done going in the other direction is um, the parameters for ammonia we tested twice per month in the past. This permit requires us to take five tests on a weekly basis. So we're going from two a month to 20 a month. What we expect that means is they're setting the baseline parameters of what the, our effluent and what the treatment plant processes and we'll create a baseline and then we'll add a, a future regulation on how much we discharge is <coughs> today that's not regulated. It's just tested and reported. Um, and that's typically how the, the department goes through those changes. The second item is goes back to our combined sewer overflow, as you guys are well aware. Um, with this permit, the City of Manistee sewer system is officially no longer a combined sewer system. All of the com all of the combined sewers have been separated, so we have a separated system now. We still maintain an overflow point at the at Ramstone and Fifth Street. And so during heavy wet weather flows where the system is overwhelmed by additional water, um, there is still that potential to discharge. In 2015, we had nine of those events where the levels got high enough and it discharged. In 2016, that is reduced down to four events. Some of that is taking inflow and infiltration points offline. Some of it is just the precipitation and the, the way that the rain falls and the snow melts. Um, some of it is, uh, we believe, the cleaning of the pipes, the heavy cleaning that we've been doing through our uh, saw grant has probably added more storage within those pipes. And we think that the word that's been getting out and all the publicity that we've talked about on the legal connections and the roof drains and stuff like that, we think that there's been some self-compliance um, from either different uh, commercial facilities or residential facilities. But all of that is trending in a positive way. Because we still have the potential to discharge, the state of Michigan has required us to develop a wet weather correction, corrective action program, or a CAP. The corrective action program um, has several different milestones in it. And the first milestone was today. So two days ago, this permit took effect. Today, we had to make our first submittal. And Spicer Group has spent a tremendous amount of time getting this ready for us. But this is several pages of kind of a list of all the things that we are going to do in the next uh, four years to bring the system back into compliance. So today this draft was submitted to the state. They've got a period where they can review it, make comment, and we'll make some changes to it. Um, a year from now, we will submit a progress report to the state that identifies where we're at within that <coughs> corrective action program, how things, you know, things that we've discovered, the progress we've made, and then any additional uh, modifications to that program moving forward. In July, July 1st of 2018, we are required to submit a basis of design. 
So between now and July 1st of 2018, we have to come up with a plan of how to get the rest of the water or a substantial amount of water out of the system or be able to store and then treat, treat that water, okay? <coughs> so in <coughs> July, we spent the basis of design. Again, the state, each one of these steps, the state has an opportunity to review, comment, and ensure that we're headed in the right direction. By March 1st of 2019, we have to have plans and specifications for whatever those projects are submitted to the state, and then by permit, we have to be under construction for those projects by July of 2019, and then construction has to be completed by November of 2020. So that gives us basically three, a three-year process. Um, after the construction is completed, then we go through a period where we identify how those how the system has reacted to the construction projects and the improvements that we've done and the the ultimate goal is to <clears throat> be able to certify that the system uh, can handle the wet weather flows and then there's no longer a need to have that overflow at fifth and ramstill and decommission that the third item that is new to our permit is the requirement for us to uh, complete a asset management program. Now that is something that the state is doing with all the sewer systems across the state of Michigan. We anticipated that so when the state gave the opportunity uh, for the SAW grant we stepped on or jumped on that several years ago. Luckily we were successful in getting that 1.9 million dollars and so we'll, we're, we are well into the process of uh, inventorying all of our assets and the next steps will be to um, compile all that data and then come up with the asset management program so that we can forecast out when items need to be replaced, when capital improvement projects are to happen, and so forth. Um, we will make this, this permit has been uh, public notice for, was it 60 days? Did you look that up? I believe it was 60 days. But we can make this available on the city's website if that's of interest, and we'll certainly make it available to you through Dropbox as well. Any questions? I have some questions about, about that. Um, how is the um, ice rink coming? It's coming, it's very wet. Um, we, it freezes at night and it thaws during the day, uh, but we do have a, a it's all ready. Everything is ready. Um, we had some problems with the noodles around the top that were blowing off. The guys came up with a very creative system to hold those down. Uh, Mr. Zelensky was familiar with that issue the last couple of years. If you take a ride by there, they came up with a brilliant system on how to keep them down. Very low cost. We're excited that we made that improvement. Um, we're going to start moving down the flooring for the teen center and the, the, the uh, skates. Um, so we're just waiting for some cold weather and then we'll, we'll open it up. And then have you had any issues with water when freezes yet? Yeah. Uh, no. Frost is two feet in the ground already though, believe it or not. The, the dig jobs that we've been doing to repair just normal water services, the guys are finding that the uh, frost is at least two feet below the roads. Are they only volunteers who move the snow off of the, the ice rink this year or are they going to, the city going to do that? We would certainly welcome any volunteer help for those efforts. Um, we're going to try a little bit different winter schedule with our night crew this year. Uh, the shift is going to begin actually this upcoming Sunday and we're going to have those guys working from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. So uh, I think that should help a little bit in, in getting us some better manpower to help out with, with getting the snow off of the rink. But you know when it's really snowing we're out doing the rest of the city. So. We're talking we're supposed to get quite a bit in the next the rest of the week. Right. Um, and it's supposed to be really cold so it ought to make some ice. But I did see some people skating. Out there, did you? Yeah, they were off their skating, yeah. Yeah, today it's all water. Uh, we, we probably had a good half inch, three quarters of an inch ice on Thursday, um, and then it, it all melted, so. But just real quick, is there a schedule, you know, I don't know, the, how is the teen center, teen center handling the snow removal, or do we just, how would we go about, if somebody wanted to volunteer, how would they go about doing that? I would suggest that they contact the teen center and um, 
I'm not sure if they're, they're maintaining a list, but I think they've maintained a list of volunteers in the past, and when they needed help, they've, they've reached out. Snowblower still there? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. City Engineer? Welcome, Your Honor. Thank you. Again, Tamara, I just uh, want to thank you for your presentation, but I also want to give you a reason why it's really important that we can get this online. I have a lot of people that come to me and they ask me things like, well, what exactly are we getting from AES? Mm -hmm. Well, we get, these, we get these nice updates from them, but I don't have anything to direct them to or anything to show them. I would love to be able to say, hey, go online to our agendas. We have it on our agendas, and they can see what's going to be up here, and we might get some more participation from people without them wondering what's going on or me trying to remember exactly everything that was said properly without having to dig for it too hard. I think we welcome that opportunity for you to be able to pass that on for sure. So thank you. Okay. That. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. I just wanted to thank Michelle and all of those. I don't want to miss anybody, so I'm not going to mention anybody but Michelle. Everybody down there and all the hard work they do. I happened to be in the building when they were having some issues with some people, and they were handled very professionally. Um, and you couldn't ask for any better help. Them, and I do appreciate all that they do. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Uh, Lisa Clark from Love Inc. They run Love Inc. Uh, Safe Harbor. They look for volunteers to bring mills in. If you haven't done it, do it. It's a blast. You can actually go there, eat with the, the residents that are staying there right now. It's a good cause. Um, and also, look for people to donate food or meals, not food. Bring the meals to it. Let's go. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> uh, I'd like to thank Michelle. The, uh, your election crew uh, does a phenomenal job. Uh, I'm, I'm glad the consolidation has worked out and it's really wonderful to see the expenses down uh, from what they were in 2012. Wonderful job. And Tamara, thank you for a good presentation. And I would follow up with Council Member Beaton if we had an electronic form of that, it would go a long way in, in answering some questions that people often ask us after the fact. Uh, at this time, we have consideration of adjourning to a closed session, union contract negotiations, City Manager Thad Taylor has requested a closed session this evening as permitted by Michigan Open Meeting Act Section 8C to discuss contract negotiations with the United Steel Workers. I'll make the motion. Seconded. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Zelensky, <coughs> Council Member Beaton, adjourned.